Uh, I hope to be able to identify elements of thinking about resilience that will be relevant to the meeting over the next two days. And my personal intention is through that presentation of thinking to help you as you advance towards a consensus that will make a difference to the lives of millions of people. So there are three main themes to what I would like to share with you. The first is to address the question, does a resilience approach to food and nutrition security represent a new way of thinking and action, or is it just a repackaging of what is already being done? Is it new, or is it the old stuff in a new package? Number two, given that those of us who are working in development assistance are increasingly being asked to demonstrate results that are tangible and can be understood particularly by taxpayers. Can resilience easily be measured in a meaningful way that can then be presented back to parliamentarians and to taxpayers? And thirdly, if resilience is a new way of working, uh, sorry, a new way of thinking, and if it is measurable, what does that mean for how organizations, particularly donor organizations and other development partners, actually work in practice? I'll come back to those three themes at intervals during this uh, opening talk. And also, I, because I'm going to be here throughout today, I shall be reverting back to it, especially during the World Cafe discussion this afternoon. But just moving into this discussion, we may need to be a bit precise about how we start our discussions on resilience. Because in the current context, particularly in 2012, as we're moving towards Rio Plus 20, we might well find that there are people who, when they are discussing resilience, focus primarily on, for example, resilience of natural resources in our planet. They may apply it to water supplies. They may apply it to the environment. We might find that there are people applying the term resilience to production systems, oil production, food production, mineral production. Or we might find that there are people applying the term resilience to how individuals and societies are living and are handling stresses. As I move in, I want to be very clear. When I talk about resilience today, I'm talking about the resilience of people and their societies in the face of a variety of different threats. I'm picking up from where the State Secretary left off with her focus on the resilience of the individual and of communities. So now going into my three themes. Is this new or is this just repackaging what is already done? Well, of course, as in all things, it's a bit of both. Because many of you have already been focusing on resilience, particularly of livelihoods, in your professional work. But I do think it's new. I want to pick up again from what the State Secretary said. She referred to us, or referred to the global community, as fighting hunger. And I think that's true. I think, in general, that's what does unite us. But we're going beyond that, as she said. We're doing, using a twin track of fighting hunger and trying to ensure long-term uh, resilience of food systems. But I think if we get inside resilience thinking, what we're actually doing 
is we're not fighting hunger. We're not even trying to ensure that food systems are resilient. Instead, what we're doing is trying to enable individuals, households and societies themselves to be better able to tackle hunger when it occurs, to be better able to preserve livelihoods when they are endangered, and to be better able to develop long-term and sustainable production capacity that keeps them safe and secure. So instead of defining the challenge in terms of what has to be done in global terms or even in local terms as an abstract notion, fighting hunger. Instead, we're focusing on the capabilities of households and societies to address hunger themselves. Semantics, you may say, just words. What's the big deal? I think it's huge. Because I think that as soon as we adopt a resilience narrative which talks about improving the capabilities of individuals, households and societies to withstand threats, we are defining our work in terms of supporting them so that they can do things better for themselves, supporting them so that they are better able to withstand stresses and threats. We could go further. Perhaps instead of talking about reducing vulnerability, we speak about strengthening resilience. Perhaps we turn that narrative round as well. Because a resilient society, by definition, is less vulnerable. But also, by defining it in terms of strengthening resilience, we're defining it in terms of people's capabilities of the capacities of institutions, instead of all the time referring to what we, as the donor community or international actors, seek to do. Put it simply, we move from talking about what we do to talking about what capacities are reinforced within individuals, households and societies. And I like the word reinforced because we start from the basic fundamental belief that actually human individuals, households and societies are incredibly resilient. They cope with all manner of stresses, particularly if people are exceedingly poor. And the most resilient people are almost always the women because they have to sh shelter particularly children, particularly other dependents, from the stresses. And so we are seeking to reinforce that resilience capacity which already exists. And this fits within a rights framework. We don't need to worry about that. It's there. But it's more than that. It's a framework of empowerment that starts from a belief and a practice which says that people actually are incredibly resilient anyway and our job is to seek to build that. I have personally, just slipping on from thinking about whether it's new or whether it's repackaged, I have now a wish to lighten it a bit and just say that in my own life I've had several occasions where I have come to recognize that resilience thinking is incredibly useful. As many of you know, I'm a medical doctor. And so I've been working on uh, individual health challenges and public health challenges most of my life. And one of the main public health events and uh, transitions that occurred during my life was the emergence of HIV AIDS as an individual disease, as a societal challenge, and watching how professionals from different sectors 
as well as politicians, responded to the way HIV and AIDS emerged. And this was an example of how the response shifted from being a typical health response that saw HIV AIDS as a disease that needed to be tackled with interventions from outside to a societal challenge which, uh, which threatened the resilience of numerous societies all over the world. And the emerging paradigm on HIV AIDS, and it's taken 15 years for this to happen, has shifted from external interference with medicines or prescriptions from the health profession to a focus on empowering individuals and communities so that they can not only live with HIV and be resilient in the face of that, but also through that develop new opportunities and ways of working that enable them to be resilient against many more threats. I watched the same shift in thinking happen around pandemics, both avian influenza as a pandemic amongst poultry, and then the threats and the eventual realization of a human influenza pandemic in the last five years. Again, I saw the shift in thinking from seeing the response as being one that is primarily a set of medical interventions to one which is about societies empowered to be resilient in the face of that and other potential threats. Because what we learnt through the analysis of whole of society pandemic preparedness is that the capacities that can be built through a people-centred and a society-centred approach don't just apply to pandemic influenza, they can apply to many other similar large-scale threats that are of an unpredictable kind. And then more recently, I watched as the challenge of extreme food insecurity emerged in the Horn of Africa in 2010 and then through 2011. And I mean, you may have different analyses from myself, but I see how the investments over many years within Ethiopia in productive safety net systems, and then in Kenya in social protection systems that pay attention to the realities of dry land existence, that these enabled communities in Ethiopia and in Kenya to be far more resilient in the face of the 2010 drought than would have been the case 15 or 20 years ago. And we've got the example because in the previous major drought in the 80s in the Horn of Africa, the impact in terms of lives lost and suffering was far, far greater, even though the extent of the drought was considerably less. So there has been real investment in resilience in these countries, and in my judgment, it has paid off. So now moving to my second theme, which is measurement. How to think about the measurement of resilience. Samantha, you're so good. Instead of giving me a one-minute sign, which I thought it was initially, I thought, oops, it was a 10-minute sign, but I won't be 10 minutes. How to think about measuring resilience. I think this is difficult, and I would like to challenge you during these two days to focus on this. Because if we do accept, and I think most people in this room will, that resilience represents an important new way of thinking and an important paradigm for our work, and that it is fundamentally uh, a focus on reinforcing individual, household and societal resilience that's our focus, then how can we incorporate in our practice appropriate metrices so that the 
impact on resilience can be demonstrated? Well, firstly, I think we would all agree that capacity for resilience within households and societies particularly is best defined from within those societies and not from outside. Now, of course, that immediately means that we will sense that resilience is a subjective phenomenon, that the definition of resilience depends on how the individual or society perceives that it is able to withstand stresses. And perhaps, certainly in planning for resilience, we will need to incorporate a major subjective element to the definition. Quite simply, it will depend on whether or not people within communities perceive that they are better prepared to withstand stresses. But then the, the counter argument is that we also need a more objective set of measures of resilience. And by that, we will probably need to develop ways of measurement that reflect an analysis of societies under stress. A bit like stress testing a bank, or stress testing a production system, or stress testing a preparedness plan against an emergency, we will need to find ways to stress test the resilience of societies even in situations where they are not under threat. I do not believe this is impossible. It just requires the same sort of thinking as has been used for stress testing in other areas. And I believe that this group is perfectly capable of thinking that through. I would also like to suggest that in analyzing and measuring resilience, we need to build on the work being done by communities involved in climate smart agriculture, in developing systems for risk management in food security systems, and other practical areas that help us to define resilience capacity and measure it. And I also believe that what the State Secretary spoke about, the nexus, is important. And that if we're focusing on resilience with regard to food and nutrition security, we must take account of water, environmental issues, energy, and other variables at the same time. Thirdly, on to different ways of working if we are going to approach the resilience thinking and paradigm in an effective way. First of all, let us remember that the way in which we work depends on the culture and mindsets of the people who are doing the work. I suspect that there will have to be a culture shift, not just in donor organizations, but also in the institutions of the United Nations and in many governments to take on and implement resilience work in practice. Because most importantly, if it's a focus on reinforcing existing capacities, it also requires at all times building on and not undermining what already exists. Everyone in this room has seen examples of hasty humanitarian interventions entering into a space where institutions and capacities are quite weak and harming and undermining those weak capacities through misguided and sometimes clumsy external action. And the culture must always be one of starting from the capacities that exist, the institutions that exist, the individuals that are in place, and in particular the informal arrangements, the informal arrangements that they have rather than always sticking with formal institutions. A particular example is with pastoralist societies. And you will be having a session this afternoon from Gary Smith on that, so I don't want to trespass on what he might be saying. 
but the institutions that work within pastoral societies inevitably have to be seen by governments as institutions in a, a category of their own. Otherwise, there's a temptation by governments to ride over those institutions and to undermine them. Secondly, if people and their cultures matter, we will need to be investing in networks of practitioners who are able and skilled to operate effectively on resilience using the kind of practices I describe. Networks are rich sources of energy for transforming how action is undertaken. And they sometimes can transcend the more difficult process of changing the way in which institutions and organizations work. So networks of resilience practitioners will be an important way forward, especially in food and nutrition security. Thirdly, to bring about changes in ways in which we work, inevitably politicians, particularly those in ministerial or heads of state and government position, are critically important. I hope that some, some of the current efforts underway to help political champions for resilience to emerge will take off and will lead to new uh, arguments for resilience work within development practice and within governmental, uh, governmental processes. Fourthly, institutional change. Uh, as was implied by the State Secretary when she spoke and described the German approach on future makers, I want to stress that in my judgment, without joining up sectors, joining up cultures, and joining up institutions, resilience work is impossible. Siloed approaches to development lead to external pushing interventions. Holistic approaches are far more likely to start from where people are at and to reinforce. So finally, to summarize, let the focus in this group be on people's resilience, and link it to resilience of the planet and resilience of production systems, but put people at the center. As we move into Rio plus 20, we should seek to avoid that effort to divide development into three different pillars and say it is people that matter the most and the other elements need to be incorporated within that narrative. Number two, resilience thinking is new. It does mean building on what we've done already but because it's about reinforcing existing capacities and enabling individuals, households, and societies to withstand threats, it is a new way of thinking and will imply new metrices and ways of working. Thirdly, metrices are possible. They will have to include subjective elements based on what people feel, but also stress testing of societal systems and household systems is a way of testing for resilience that has been used in other sectors and we can develop it, develop it in food and nutrition security. Fourthly, new ways of working are critical, involving culture change, networks of practitioners, political champions, and absolutely joined up institutions and in particular not allowing that unfortunate continued separation between humanitarian action and development that characterizes so many of our institutions. Thank you for the chance to give this presentation.